You ready to rock and roll, Maria? Ready, let's do it. All right, hey there, gang. Um, Eric Guy here, Center for Victory. We're gonna be talking today about mastering communication. Uh, we have our lovely guest, the executive consultant, uh, Maria Stevens on the line. She's gonna be talking to us, uh, as I said, about mastering communication, uh, giving us some tips uh, to utilize as soon as we walk out of here today. Uh, I'm looking forward to it, Maria. Uh, so I'm going to shut up and then let you take over and you walk us through. And then uh, we're going to take, as like we normally do, we'll take some questions at the end. Mm -hmm. um, so about, you know, 30 minutes of, of content, 25, 30 minutes of content. Then we'll take about 15 or 10 or 15 minutes for questions. And then everybody, uh, if you're on the line, this is your first time. Um, we do have this recording on our YouTube channel, so you'll be able to pull it off. You can share it with anybody. Uh, they don't have to be a client or anybody. Feel free to share it, share it with your teams. I know we have a couple teams on the line, so welcome. And then I uh, just wanted to give one uh, little shout out to, I saw some of our new Jedis that we, they got trained last week. So welcome aboard. Hopefully you get the, the same benefit everybody else gets. But. Take it over, Maria. Let's let's hear what you have to say. It's good stuff. All right. Well, thank you so much, Eric, and thank you all for being here this morning. I am thrilled to be able to share this content with you. Talking about communication, it's one of my absolute favorite topics to speak about, to teach about, and train on. Um, it's really my feeling that communication is part of everything that we do. Um, it's, it's my belief that it's in these everyday communication moments that make or break us as a team, as an organization. And again, it's truly part of everything that we do. To me, it is the vehicle that creates what our culture is. So we're really gonna be going over today <clears throat> how we can use communication to our advantage. Because if we do, it can be a great, one of the greatest assets that we have in our organizations today. So that's the content that we're gonna go through together this morning. <clears throat> I do a lot of communication classes for companies. And generally when I teach this class and go over the content that you're gonna get today, certainly in a, in a much more extended format. Um, but generally when I kick off the class and we start talking about well, what are some of the key challenges of communication or what are what are some of the biggest frustrations that people have in the workplace today and i've taught it enough time to kind of enough times to come up with these the, the top list i guess of what bothers people the most in the in the workplace today so some of the complaints that i hear um, are i would start with people not being able to react to stress well um, in other words, in the leadership world, we call that emotional intelligence, right? But folks don't generally come up to me and say, hi, I'm struggling with emotional intelligence. What they'll generally say is, gosh, our people just let things escalate. Um, we, have, we have conflict that shouldn't be there. People don't react well to stress. Um, people really overreact to things. That's a thing that I hear a lot. So certainly when, when that's going on in the workplace, that can create a lot of challenges, right? Because if we're overly stressed, it's gonna get in the way of us being able to have an accurate per, uh, perspective on the problem, which is gonna get in the way of our ability to effectively solve that problem. So certainly having low emotional intelligence in the workplace can, can really uh, put a damper on morale. Um, and it's hard to be productive when we have a lot of that emotional noise going on. Um, another issue that I'll hear quite a bit on is team members, leaders at any level in the organization having a hard time just being decisive uh, to handle a tough conversation. So I would say one of the biggest uh, concerns or questions or issues that I hear about is people wanting to avoid having a difficult conversation, not feeling comfortable, feeling overwhelmed by it, um, just wanting it to go away and and hoping that the issue will resolve itself which as we know it generally doesn't so i think a, a just an overall lack of confidence people just not being comfortable with confrontation is a big issue uh, thirdly i would also say 
poor listening skills is an issue that comes up quite a bit. And this is a big one because I would argue that as leaders, it's one of the most important things that we need to do every single day is be, be great listeners. And when that's not in place, again, our productivity drops. We have to go back and circle back and reconnect uh, because we, we missed what was going on in the meeting or we were distracted, we just can't listen. I would also say sometimes I hear about leaders and folks not being able to connect well, um, not being able to do a good job of, of relationship building. And you know we know and we've heard, um, if you've been on any other webinars and you follow Center for Victory, we know how leading the millennials is, is, uh, is unique. And they are really looking for that additional connection and that meaning in relationships. So that's just a, a, a sharing of some of the issues and complaints that I hear. And I would imagine that many of those, um, if not all of them, would, would, reg would resonate with, with those of you that are on the call this morning. So it's a back background on the challenges. I want to talk a bit about some of the causes of, of what why these issues are in place in the organization and then we're going to get into of course the framework for solving them so when we think about why is it such a challenge for us to communicate effectively in the workplace why are these problems so pervasive there's a number of reasons first is a lack of agreement on what i would say is content so in other words people may have different ideas as to what's acceptable and what's okay to talk about in other words, is it okay to compliment my boss? Is that something that we're allowed to talk about around here? Different understanding creates people taking that and internalizing it in different ways. There's oftentimes also a lack of agreement on process. And what I mean by that is what methods and means should we be using to make sure that everybody in this organization is hearing what they need to hear? Um, so are we all leveraging a, a structured feedback model? Are we using radical candor? Um, are we all, you know, leveraging meetings the same way? Um, you know, are we, are we following a template? Is there a structure to it? Again, usually this left to the individual employee, so we can get mixed results there. Cultural norms can be different within the business too. Are there unwritten rules in the business? In other words, hey, you know, I heard you never go to the sixth floor. You know, you just, you don't do that. Um, some people may follow that and some people may not, but there could be these unwritten rules. So when you have all of these just different discrepancies within the business, it can obviously create a lot of misalignment, uh, you know, confusion and disengagement. And that's everything that we don't want in our companies, in our organizations today. The last thing really is the biggest cause of what we see with individuals today is just not having the skill set and the preparedness to, to lead effectively and to know how to communicate effectively in the workplace. Statistics say we spend about 70% of our day communicating. That's a huge chunk of our day, both personally and professionally. But when you think about it, really consider what is your preparedness to know how to communicate effectively, right? I mean, maybe you took a public speaking class in college, you know, maybe you did, but it was probably on giving speeches. I taught that class. I taught the public speaking class actually, and that's what we taught people to do. But most of us aren't going around giving speeches every day, right? We need to have tough conversations. You know, that's what we need to focus on. We need to be able to hold people accountable. We need to be able to know how to give people positive feedback. We need to leverage tools and leverage a, a, an effective way of communicating so that we can drive the outcomes that we want. So if you end up in a business today, that communication component of it is largely left out of HR handbooks, manuals, onboarding. It's just not there. So people are kind of left to just figure it out on their own, right? Figure out, hey, I, this, is, this is what I think is good. Well, hey, I was taught, you know, 15 years ago that, if you get an email, you should respond within 24 hours. If you work for a great company, you've got more of those guidelines and those core values, but still, what's the, what's the recipe to execute, right? How you're gonna actually move it forward. Um, so the, the 
the, the opportunity is there to really address that because we know from looking at decades of research and from training professionals how important and how significant communication can be and driving those organizational outcomes that we want. We know that that can move the needle. It can create better decision making, which is what every organization wants. It creates better relationships. It increases engagement. It drives all the outcomes that we want. So it behooves all of us to understand a recipe for moving that forward. So I wanna talk about as we go through the, the content that I'm gonna share with you today, a little bit about where it came from. So uh, in my professional career, and I've been almost 25 years now doing leadership development, training, uh, coach, executive coaching, and the bulk of the work that I've done over these past 25 years um, has, has focused heavily on, again, leadership development and being able to help people communicate more effectively. So over time, clients were coming to me more and more and saying, here, you know, Maria, this situation happened. Can you tell me what to say? Can you tell me what to do? Um, here's what took place. I need to have a conversation. How do, I, how do I play it? So over time, it became very, very apparent to me that a lot of clients, and in fact, a lot of people at companies need this model, sort of like a, a way to script how to handle a variety of situations that come up every day. So I ended up being that a lot of the work that I was doing was almost like a scripting for people. And through that process, what I learned is that it was repeatable and that while communication is unique and you need to be flexible and you, you can't predict what another person is gonna say, there are some guiding principles that are always universal that work in every situation. And so the model that I ended up following and the model that I ended up helping so many people with is the model that I'm going to share with you today that helps leaders respond versus react. And I think that's extremely important. So I'll say it again. This model that I want to walk you through today is what allows leaders to respond versus react. And there's a huge difference there because the reacting is the kind of that emotional uh, knee jerk, very can be emotionally charged, can not always give us the best outcome. It can distort what we're trying to do uh, when the emotions are guiding us. And emotions, by the way, are great. We just don't want them to dictate how we're communicating. Responding is being proactive, being thoughtful, and executing in a way that's gonna drive the outcome that we want, and also preserve relationships as well as our personal brand. So this is really, the material I'm gonna share with you is really about having a playbook, right? Because there's tons of books out there. What I like to really do is give people practical strategies that they can execute. So it's a fallback framework for a variety of situations um, that we can use to be successful in our day-to-day -day communication. So let's take a look at how this plays out and what this looks like. So the model that we're gonna to review today, again, this is what I use and this is what's helped so many leaders just focus and, and have a strong personal brand and preserve and build a great culture. LAPD plus R, listen, assess, prepare, deliver, and receive. So those are the steps of the model that we're gonna go through today. Listening being the, I put beginning, middle, and end because everything starts there, it, it, it ends there, um, most critical. Um, assessing the situation is all about sort of checking and using emotional intelligence to make sure we're really getting a good read on what's taking place before we respond to it. Prepare is all about, okay, based on what I know, I'm going to put a few key points together. And then delivering it is the manner, right? So your nonverbals, your body language, the tone of voice, all that good stuff, which is extremely important. And then receiving getting feedback as to how the communication is going both in real time as well as by overtly asking for it. So let's take a dive into the first component of our model here, listening. It says that I'm here listening and it's a skill and I, I wanna call that out because most people, you know, kind of just feel like, hey, I'm, you know, hey, I've been communicating my whole life. I'm pretty good by now. Um, and that's, as we know, not entirely true. 
Um, it is a skill that we have to focus on to get better at. Uh, we struggle because we probably haven't had great people modeling listening for us. So it's hard to know what great listening should look like and, and how we should, how we would know. Um, but most people when I teach this class pretty readily say, yeah, I, I struggle with this. I have a hard time. And I have on this slide, the listening dilemma. That's all about just the, the, the biological barrier, I call it. The, the average person speaks at a rate of about 150 words per minute, but actually our brains can take in information at about 10 times that rate. So if our brains can process information at a much quicker pace than the words coming out of my mouth right now, what's gonna happen? Our brains are going to wander. And generally that is what occurs unless we're extremely mindful and intentional and we've practiced the listening skill. So it, like any other skill, learning a foreign language, learning how to cook, listening requires some intentional practice and reflection as well to get better at it because we do have biology working against us. We're, our brains are actually wired for interruption right? Because why? In the caveman days, if you were getting interrupted, that meant food, right? It meant survival. So your brain is wired to be distracted. You actually have to train your brain to pay attention. And usually at this point in the class, people will raise their hand and say, well, what if the speaker is really boring, <laughs> right? Um, so we'll get to that in a minute. But what I always share when it comes to communication is that both the sender, so that would be the person initiating the message or the speaker, both the sender and then the receiver, who's the person receiving and taking in that message, both parties are accountable for that communication going well, right? The speaker can do some things that we're gonna go through here today to, to do a better job of keeping people engaged. But on the receiving end, as listeners, we also have to do our part. We've gotta find ways that we can stay engaged, what we can do um, that will work for us to become stronger at listening. Leaders are called to be the ultimate listener, right? That's a huge part of what we do in leadership. So if you have that inclination that you or folks that you work with, your key counterparts, your staff, if you have that inclination that, it, that that's what's going on and you see people being distracted in meetings, then it's something that we have to address because a lot is getting missed. If you aren't hearing the bulk of the issue or you're, you're missing key pieces of it, how can you coach someone, right? How can you give them great advice? It all requires listening. And I don't, and I, lots of times too, um, I, I see folks and they'll say, oh, I'm a great listener, but what are we listening for, right? As leaders, we're held to a higher standard. So as leaders, we don't only want to listen for agreement. I think more importantly, we want to listen for discrepancies all the time. We want to be listening for that. We want to be looking for that. So when it comes to that, you all have probably seen, I mean, you could Google listening skills and you could come up with a list of tips. They've been out there for a long time. But when we think about what can I do, I believe it really comes down to looking at one or two things out of that list, right? You've probably seen something before that says interactive listening tips. Okay, there's different things that I could do. I can, I can make better eye contact. I can you know, try and ask more questions. I can maybe make notes to manage my thoughts. If you, you know, if you feel like you have a tendency to interrupt, if you feel like you have the tendency to over talk, there's different things that you can do. But what I did that worked for me was just really paying attention to, because my work depends, like many of us, it depends on being a good listener. So earlier in my career, I said, okay, well, I feel distracted. I feel like my brain gets distracted. So I paid attention to that and said, okay, well, what's not working? Part of what wasn't working for me was just that I was too rushed and I was just, just going too fast and I was just distracted. So just the simple intention and habit of slowing myself down gets me into the right state of mind so that if I'm sitting across from a client or a friend or whomever it may be, I'm not trying to rush them. And when I slow myself down, it just kind of cues my brain to listen. So the slowing down because of my wiring and because how I made, I'm a very, very, very fast paced, impatient, driven person. So that really worked for me to just remind myself, okay, I'm going into three back-to-back -back meetings and it's all about them. So I'm going to 
take my normal energy, which is like this, a lot more fast paced and enthusiastic and energetic, I'm gonna kind of shift that because these meetings are all about them and I'm gonna slow myself down. And there's other things that I, that I, John, that I could share if we had more time and there's more resources I can send along. But that one was the biggest game changer for me. But what's cool about that is I just chose, I reflected on it and I picked what was gonna work for me. So that's super important is to choose that focus and to be really specific. Because there's lots of tips out there on listening, but it's finding what works for you and knowing, okay, well, this, this is my tendency. I just tend to get bored or I tend to get distracted. It's a muscle that we have to build like any other muscle. Okay, so I know I harp on listening, but it's really critical because this is the beginning of us being able to communicate better, to respond is by hearing fully what's going on. The next component of the model looking at assess is what happened. So this is the filter through which when we hear something, if we're listening effectively, this is the filter through which we look at something and say, well, what's really going on here? I have emotional intelligence on here because this, this directly impacts our ability to effectively hear, perceive, and determine what something means. So before anything even comes out of your mouth, before you ever even respond, this is the, the key step in the process where your brain is saying, well, this was offensive or this was inappropriate. And the filter that really is making that decision is this emotional intelligence. So, you know, when we look at speaking and communicating and responding, it's impossible to be a great communicator if we don't have strong emotional intelligence. Because, so that, that's why this has to be part of what we talk about communicating, because you, you can't just dress it up. If you are distorted, if you're overly upset, everything that ha happens after that, if you communicate, is gonna be a miss. Everything that happens after that is gonna be a conflict. It's going to be you know, a, a missed opportunity because this is where we're deciding, okay, I'm trying to determine, this is my perception. So this is the point in the communication where we have a coaching or if there's a conflict where we have to look at that and say, what's really going on here? And I learned this through my own kind of my own development, but also from working with clients. Cause when they would tell me something was wrong, we'll say, Maria, this happened, tell me what to say. And I'm like, well, wait a second, let's figure out the, the whole, all the dynamics. Is it possible that this occurred? Is it possible that your perception, you know, so this is the, the step that's key. And obviously today I can't dive into all of the components of this, but in the class, we do a full blown, you know, deep dive into this. Self-awareness, heart of, that's the heart of emotional intelligence. You have to be able to take a, a, an honest look at yourself. Self-regulation, it's all about, are you overreacting or can you remember, respond versus react. Motivation, folks with high emotional intelligence are intrinsically motivated and they're able to do things and be self-starters. Empathy, being able to think and relate to another person and um, be able to think about it from their perspective and social skills. Being able to have a, a good, uh, being open and being approachable. So social skills doesn't mean you have to be extremely uh, extroverted and outgoing. It just means that you're, you're approachable. These are the components of people with high IQ. And so when you think about yourself and you think about behavior in the workplace and you say, well, gosh, that person just, they overreacted. Um, and so the words that followed, you know, it was, it just, it didn't go well. Um, emotional intelligence is that when your ability to, you get something through email that doesn't sit with you well, it just, you're, you're heated and you're charged. And you're able to look at that and say, you know what, I'm gonna wait 24 hours before I respond to that. That's practicing good emotional intelligence. So we could probably all think of folks who lack this. Um, and the, the goal isn't that we all have to have every component in competency, you know, master level. But I think it gives us a really important lens to say, if I'm struggling with something in my own life, I can look at that and say, I tell my, my, my classes and my clients all the time, I have this phrase and it says, challenge your own BS. And that, what, what I mean by that is when something happens, 
What story are you telling yourself about that, right? What's the story? Um, if your emotional intelligence is struggling in some of those areas, you could really personalize it. You could really make it 10 times worse than it is. And then the communication after that is going to reflect that. So challenge your own BS is important. And also being able to give someone else that perspective, it just takes the level of conflicts and the intensity way down. So I always want to cover this when we go over communication and it's a key component of what I teach because it's critical to knowing how to communicate better. It's what goes in here, then this part will be much better. So the prepare piece, this is all about, a lot of it is common sense. Okay, a lot of this is common sense, but I'm always, you know, amazed at sitting down with clients and talking with them about situations and they'll say, well, this is what happened. And I'll say, okay, so help me understand a little bit about what you're thinking and what your goal is of this conversation. Like, what do you want to accomplish? And I kind of just get like the blank stare, you know, like, oh, I hadn't thought about it. You know, I'm just going to go in and just have a good talk. And um, lots of times it just, we talk in circles and we waste a lot of time. So do you have to go through these steps every single, you know, every single conversation you have all day? No, I'm certainly not going to give you something where you have to memorize and add a bunch of steps to your work day. But when you have a crucial conversation, when you're having a key communication moment, you want to take a couple minutes and you can do this in a few minutes. You want to take a couple minutes and go, all right, who am I communicating with? What is their PI? Is a great thing to do, right? How do they take in information and how do they receive it is an excellent way to boost your chance of being 10 times more effective. Because we don't want to communicate the same way to everyone in meetings, in one-on-ones, because if we do that, we're not going to be that effective. People can tune us out. They have a short wherewithal for meetings, right? Some versus others. Uh, some need different kinds of communication. So you want to at least think about that, which can take two minutes to do. What is not only your goal, but their goal? So it's, it's just such a powerful thing when a leader walks into a meeting with another individual or even on a conference call and says, I'm going to give you the high level of the agenda of what we're going to cover today. Um, I believe, you know, this is where I'd like to go. I would love to hear from you. What, how would you define this as being a successful conversation today? That is so powerful, so effective. It really creates buy-in and it shows the other person, hey, they took the time to be prepared. I would rather folks be a few minutes late to a meeting and be prepared rather than come in on time and just flounder. Um, and then I just go, you know, no matter who we're communicating with, if you, if you have no idea what you think the other person is wanting to accomplish, always know and remember the basic needs to engage, to talk with people and not at them. So, you know, the, the public speaking adages of knowing your audience, that's kind of what we're talking about here, but just on a, a less formal scale. We're talking about knowing who you're engaging with and using that as part of your compass to make sure that you're more effective in your communication. So delivery, this is where the, the rubber meets the road or <laughs> for good, bad, or indifferent. But I have on here Aristotle's quote. I used to teach this when I taught public speaking. Delivery is of the utmost importance, but it shouldn't be. And really what he's saying there back in the days of the orators and the great philosophers, he basically was saying that how you say something is more important than what you say. And it shouldn't be that way, but it is that way, right? So we can all think about moments where, hey, the, the content was good, but um, the way that it was, the way that it was delivered just did not sit well with me. So that piece of it is again worth really reflecting to say, are my nonverbals, which is the the you know the everything but the words, right? The nonverbals they say make up for about 93% of the meaning of a message. The words make up about 7%. So when someone takes a meaning away from a, from a conversation, what they're really thinking about is the manner in which you delivered that message. Were you engaged? 
did your nonverbals, the tone of voice, eye contact, um, how fast you were speaking, how loud you were speaking, uh, again, your body language, did all of that match up with the words? If it didn't, we're gonna be sending mixed messages and people are gonna be able to perceive that that's not authentic, that it's not genuine. Uh, so it's important to be able to, uh, to pay attention to that and being mindful of body language, asking people for feedback to say, hey, I'm really trying to work on my eye contact, how did I do? But it's, it's I think, very important for people to understand that because it just, it's, a, it's the difference between, you know, you want people to buy into what you're saying and you want people to be energetic. And I always hold leaders accountable to this because they'll say, well, my people aren't, you know, they're not engaged and they're not excited, but they're talking to me in this very, they're checked out. So it's like, well, are you, are you engaged by this initiative? Because if it's coming across that way, people aren't going to buy into that because it's just, it's not adding up. Uh, there's also a lot to talk about here as it relates to, you know, being able to be vulnerable in our delivery and selecting the language of leadership. And when I talk about the language of leadership, what I really mean there is, is the language that you're using yourself as well as within the organization, is it in line with the core values that you've developed, right? So lots of companies spend time developing core values, but what communication is, is it's, it's the execution of that. It's really, it's the expression of how are we living that? It's the conversations that really build that culture. So are we saying accountability is important, but we don't talk about it and we're not really having the tough conversations? That's misalignment. So language of leadership is all about how are we communicating? What is the language that we're selecting? Is it, you know, when people are saying, hey, this is never gonna work, you know, we've tried this before, it just doesn't work. Um, how are we responding to that? Are we saying, you know, well, well, how can we make that work? Well, how can we, are we, if we're saying that problem solving and we're, we're creative problem solvers, are we living that in our culture and in the way that we communicate? What is the quality of those conversations? What's the quality of those meetings? The last piece of the model, the R in the LAPD plus R is receiving, and I can't tell you, even though it's last in the model, how absolutely critical this is. The greatest communicators and the greatest leaders are ones that are able to adapt and be flexible. If you look up competent communicators out there, it'll say flexible to the constraints of the situation. So that means if we're giving a presentation and we can see that people's eyes are glazing over or we can tell that people are rushed, you adjust to that. You can do that in real time. Great communicators do that. If we walk into a meeting and we can see that it's a different setup than what we originally thought, or if we can see that someone's upset or the agenda has to change, we have to be nimble to that. The other aspect of, of getting feedback, and it's something that I live by, is asking for it all the time and being brave enough because it takes courage to ask for feedback to say you know how what did you think of that and i don't mean kind of like the standard hey how was that meeting good great great i mean that's not right that doesn't help us i mean you know give me a score give me something really specific hey i'm really trying to work on uh let's say i'm trying to work on making sure that everybody has an equal chance to speak in that meeting you know eric how did i do pretty good so you'd say maybe about a seven you know what do you think would make it an eight I mean, really just take it to another level. The biggest game changer for me with my communication, other than I'm incredibly passionate about it, is by surrounding myself with people who are great at it and continually seeking to get better at it. So using this as a framework um, is a tried and true, the LAPD plus R, listen, that's where it all starts and holding ourselves accountable to that. Assessing, is your story true? Maybe, maybe not but let's think about it before we are off to the races and screaming down the freeway with a, with a, with a heavy charged email. Let's, let's check that first. Prepare, let's be concise, think about our audience, know who we're communicating with so that we'll increase our chances of success, deliver, 
Make sure that your delivery is sincere and genuine, authentic, given the strengths of the, situation, the situation and that the language that you're using is consistent with what you're trying to build in your company. And then receive, again, being adaptable and overtly asking so that you can continue to get better. Those are really the key steps uh, in the model of, of being a, a, a powerful leader because you can't be without having great communication skills. So Eric, I'm gonna just pause there. I just kind of you know, talked at length for a while. I wanted to give you a chance to ask any questions that may have come up or yeah, comment we, on anything. We, we do, one, thank you, that was great, especially just you know, laying out some bullet points. I know there's a lot more in those, but hopefully that'll get people started just to give them some kind of context on, on how, to, how to approach it with themselves or with others, because it is, you know, it's pretty, if you follow that, right, it takes practice. It but does. We do have a lot of questions. I'm not sure if we'll get through them all, uh, but we'll give it a shot here. So first question here, Maria, is how can we get executive teams to buy into the importance of communication skills and professional development? I would say I would put that, you know, if we just did that question, that would be good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. that's a question we hear a lot. I mean, I hear yeah. a lot. Yeah. It's absolutely uh, a challenge because communication is not looked at as a must have, and unfortunately, in a lot of instances. And the reason there is people aren't connecting the dots like in companies all the time if they're not, especially the C level executives, if they're not in the tactical day to day, like they're not recognizing that that's such a gap for folks. So, how do we give them visibility to say, how can we challenge our leaders to say, okay, well, we know we need, for example, accountability, or we know we need a better, stronger culture. By now, most C-level folks have bought into that, right? So now it's getting them to buy into the fact that those are outcomes. So we actually have to change the input to create those outcomes. So it's, it's really a mindset shift. So depending on the business, What's going to work to reach those C-level executives to say, you know, are we equipping our people to, to drive the outcomes? Do they have the skills needed to execute? So I really tr truly feel, and I mean, every organization is different in terms of how the hierarchy goes, but it, it all comes down to the C-level realizing, well, if we equip our people with the skills that they need, specifically communication, if they're equipped, then they're going to perform at a much higher level and all those outcomes that we want they're gonna that's a natural byproduct that will occur so shifting the mindset so how did we get people i mean 20 years ago people weren't saying you know there wasn't a big buzz about culture all of us in our you know leadership development we always knew for years that it was that is the driver of organizational success but a lot of companies were like, well, you can't measure that. And, you know, it's more important for us to have great products. But finally, we have gotten companies to realize that culture is, culture does trump strategy, right? It is most important. And our people are the linchpin. So we've gotten companies to buy into that. Now we have to get them to buy into it one step further, right? So by equipping our people, it's the most important thing that we can do. By equipping them, all those other outcomes that we want will be natural byproducts of them communicating and leading more effectively. So it's yeah, getting that buy-in. Yeah, and I think one of the, the things that, that we've seen by use of the PI and other analytics is like, how do people actually communicate? How do they take in information? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, are they prone to listening? Are they not prone to listening? Mm -hmm. You know, we have tendencies either way. And a lot of times you'll have people that are your great listeners. Um, they're the ones that don't get heard and validated mm -hmm. uh, because you have people that don't listen, just running over them. Um, you know, and, and it's not all, it doesn't all come down to the PI, right? There's that piece that you talked about very well about the EQ, mm -hmm. but we can heighten that EQ with an understanding of how, how people get information, how we receive it. Uh, how we best communicate, what kind of information we need in the communication. So it's all, it's all really good. Um, here's another question, Maria. How do I handle 
uh, that coworker who just doesn't have any self-awareness. And I've got, I got asked this question three times. Um, that's why I'm laughing last week uh, during the training. And it was more, uh, it was, I think it was directed towards, you know, a boss. Mm-hmm. Right? And then we hear this a lot. So what, what advice would you give there? How do I handle uh, the coworker, boss, supervisor, whoever that just doesn't have any self-awareness? Uh, you know, I was laughing too because I knew where you were going with that because it does come up quite a bit in the classes that I do, right? Because we have people that are like, yeah, I get this. It makes sense, you know, but the but is, okay, well, but if I try to practice this and they're not practicing it and they really need it, you know, what do we do? Um, and it is a frustrating situation because we, it, it means, okay, well, that person sounds like they have an opportunity to change, but they're just not seeing it. And so we're left to say, what do we do with that? Uh, so usually the coaching that I give there is, A, we can't make people change. We all know that from being in this field and being, you know, leadership development and training. We can't make people change. We can't make them get it. Um, and really, what we're responsible for is creating the opportunity for people to get it, not the outcome, right? So the first principle that I always just share on that is we're accountable as leaders to at least give them the opportunity to change and how long and how many times that depends on the situation and it depends on your culture and it depends on, you know, again, the constraints of that situation. Um, Now, if that individual refuses to see it, that situation should resolve itself, right? It should mean that if they aren't getting it and your culture is such that they need to get it, that that's a a bigger organizational issue. But I think it's really important that we realize that I'm not giving people a hall pass or a free pass to not try is what I'm saying. We still have to try and it's always frustrating But the way I feel is it gives us an opportunity to stretch and grow and get out of our comfort zone to try to reach that individual. And we may or may not, but by attempting to, we're doing what we're called to do as leaders. And if it makes us uncomfortable, then let's lean into that because it'll help us grow. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, What's the best way to handle a tough conversation? Yeah, that, uh, <clears throat> that's probably the number one thing that I do a lot of, I guess, the coaching and the scripting work on and diving in. So first of all is knowing that we want to be really prepared for that tough conversation because I would, I would identify that as a, as a crucial conversation, which if any of you, I, I follow that a lot. The Crucial Conversation is the best-selling book, you know, um, and, and what's, a, what's a crucial conversation is emotionally charged, okay, high stakes, and difference of opinion is, is what they used to define what a crucial conversation is. So you know that you've got to be prepared for that. And it amazes me that people are like, hey, it's a tough conversation. So usually what they'll do is either totally avoid it, just not do it, or be super overwhelmed. So what we have here with what we went through today is a framework that can help us say, you know, I gotta share some, some, um, some really tough feedback. Um, and it gives you a framework, you know, there's, there's the feedback model. There's also the state, uh, the crucial conversations model. It's state, share your facts, um, tell your story, ask for others, pass, talk tentatively and, and encourage testing. Then I have the feedback model. Um, so there's different ways that people can use a, a structured framework to take the overwhelm out and to be prepared and feel more confident. The biggest piece is, if, and I've had people say, hey, I've taught the crucial conversations before, and I've had people text me back later, two weeks later, saying, hey, I, I just wanted you to know I used that, and it worked really well. It really does work. So yeah. you can default to mine. You can use crucial conversations, but the key theme there is to take the time to be prepared, because if it's crucial, you it's worth it. So it's just Finding that framework, whether you use the LAPD plus R, the, the crucial conversations, 
using that framework and don't avoid it and don't procrastinate on it because the problem isn't going to go away. Okay, good. And we're running out of time. We're coming out uh, on our time, Maria, and I don't want to, we could, there's a couple more questions um, here, but I, I would like to actually end um, if you have any tips for anybody, like where do we start? I mean, obviously the model that you gave us, the LAPD plus R, I think is, a, is an excellent way to start. Um, and I'm going to use your language because I loved it. And, and I'm going to use it. And you probably know what, what it is, but um, challenge your own BS. I mean, yeah. that is like, that was my golden nugget for today. Yeah. I think that would be a good one too, finding what works for you. But is there any, are there any other tips that you would give folks on how to do this, how to get it more ingrained in their, in their company, in their culture, on their teams? So, you know, I think when we talk about getting it ingrained individually and just really implementing it, it requires that we are aware and reflective and then we're, we're, we're regularly talking about how we're doing with someone else, whether that's a mentor, any kind of accountability partner, a coach, whomever that may be. I mean, when, you, when it comes to challenging your own BS, the biggest game changer for me was working with a coach, right? Was someone saying, you know, you're, you're wrong. <laughs> You know, you're just, you're wrong. Um, and so I think that's a great humility check and it's a great way to say, you know what? Yeah, I have a tendency to think this way or I have a tendency to over-personalize and I'm going to work on that. So I think and from an individual standpoint, that's the biggest thing, being coachable and looking for what works for you, whether that's talking to a coworker, a mentor, a coach, whatever, being coachable and being open to that to say, hey, this is... This is my other quote I have to share at this point because I forgot to share it earlier. Our first reaction may not be the right one. Yeah. Okay. So it's super important that I'm not telling you to never be upset or never get angry. But what I am saying is to say, take it in and then go, what am I going to do with that? Is this justified or am I overreacting because I have a bigger issue with this person, an underlying issue with myself, or I just had a bad day? but you're gonna just sit with it and go, I don't know, I'm mad right now, but I'm just gonna kind of sit on that. So I guess that requires really being aware. When it comes to how to get organizations to really commit to that, it's a process over time, right? So some of the clients that I've worked with, um, they're very long-term relationships. And so, you know, they didn't come to me saying, we need to change our communication. They came to me with other problems. And then as I was able to work with them more and get them to see that the biggest deficit is that people are avoiding difficult conversations. And when we change that, we can change everything else. So if we have enough champions and advocates of this within a company and we can, again, get that buy-in and we believe it and we practice it, we can get people on board, but it's not going to happen overnight. We have to really stay the course to say, you know, the companies that I work with, they're the ones that say we, we want to be a destination organization. We want our business to be growth oriented and culture and people first, right? That's who we serve. And if that's, if that's the company we want to be, well, then we have to equip our people to, to achieve that. Good. Hey, can you click through the slide to the next slide for the mm -hmm. upcoming events so we can share them with everybody? Um, so these are upcoming events, folks. Uh, onboarding Essentials, that's going to be a webinar that uh, we'll be doing. Uh, I'll be doing that February 5th at noon. If you want to get your groups together in a room, uh, your HR groups, your recruiting groups, whoever it might be, um, we're going to be walking through the PI essentials of that. I'll be sharing the documents that we use and recommend as best practices for onboarding. We do have our uh, PI, uh, we have the, the training that's going on today, uh, the past couple of days that are on there, uh, managing people to perform and down in Memphis and then uh, in Cranberry here, uh, the certification training on February 25th and 26th. If you want any more information, um, you can go to our website for that or call in. Uh, if you have any further questions, you can reach out to Maria or I. Maria's email is just this, 
the same as mine. It's a first name, M-A-R-I-A at centerforvictory.com. Uh, and as always, uh, please continue to submit your questions because that, uh, you know, the last webinar that we did led to the webinar that's coming on in February, which is, what is that February 5th with that onboarding. So we appreciate those questions. We appreciate the calls. Um, keep up the great work out there and stay tuned for more. Thanks again, Maria. Yeah, that was great. That was awesome. Hopefully you can come back and give us some more uh, next month. Anytime. Thanks, everyone. Thanks right. so much for hosting, Eric. Take care.